Uh, welcome to Dr. Nader. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's the head of the International Maharishi Organization uh, based, I believe, in uh, Holland, uh, but worldwide footprint. Uh, and and I, I would love to talk to you, Dr. Nader, about your book, about ideas on consciousness, artificial intelligence, free will, uh, bionics, uh, metaverse, uh, all of that. So welcome, welcome to this uh, discussion, Dr. Nader. Namaste. Greetings to you. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful. You know, I know you well. Uh, you probably don't know that I know you well. Uh, when your book on Ramayan came out, first book, not the later version, but it was very limited. Very few copies were made. I got one of those copies uh, because I'll tell you, I'm a very old uh, uh, Maharishi uh, meditator and follower and new Maharishi in Delhi when I was a teenager. I met uh, met uh, when he, the Beatles were there. There was a big hotel. Uh, 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 I was a teenager and an older boy took me to this event. He said there's some Beatles coming and some uh, Hindu guy, gurus uh, coming and all that. So I didn't know what it was about. And this was the old <laughs> Oberoi Hotel. It was called the Oberoi Intercontinental in those days. And they were staying there. So there's a big mob of uh, people, uh, as you would expect. And so um, that's what... Uh, uh, caught my attention. And so that's how I knew him, but I didn't get initiated until I moved to San Diego, uh, you know, a decade later. And then when your book oh. came out, when your book came out, uh, uh, that was a very fascinating book uh, because it, it plotted the human physiology as a microcosm of the cosmos uh, and, and all the intelligences and uh, all of that, which I thought was very brilliant. Uh, and in fact, um, First, someone gave me a they loaned me their copy, and I was so impressed. I wanted to buy one, and they said it's not available. So I, I made a photocopy of it. I still have that photocopy. <laughs> and then, of course, a few years later, it came out in print, and I could get my own copy. So I, I'm, I'm very happy to know all of these things. And I was also part of uh, when Maharishi started the political movement. Uh, there was a political party. Yes, and, natural and, uh, law party. Huh? Yeah. The Natural Law Party. The Natural Law Party. Yes. And, and in the Natural Law Party, I, I attended some of the New Jersey meetings. <laughs> they, were, they, were oh, going to have, uh, they were going to have chapters all over. And uh, then, then there was a, uh, uh, this guy, uh, the, the fellow from, um, you know, the, for, uh, very, uh, the Texan, the young, the, that feisty Texan who started his independent movement. Uh, I forgot his name. Ah, yes, uh, yes. You know, uh, he's the he's Perot, the one who started. Perot? The, huh? Perro, Perro, Ross Perro. Yeah. Ross Perro, whom I also knew because in my ITT days we tried to acquire his company unsuccessfully, but I I, I got to know him. He started a political party, and then he didn't win the as an independent, and so he said, "I'm going to just give it away." And there was a time when the Natural Law Party th wanted to acquire his party. Merged yeah. the two of them. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah. I tried to raise the money and get enough of uh, you know people involved because I thought this could be a great Vedic party in the United States, but we were not successful. But anyway, uh, <laughs> all that was very exciting. And then I, I learned about uh, Maharishi wanted uh, you know 10,000 uh, or some large number of uh, uh, people doing uh, yagna all the time, 24-7. And he brought several of them to Fairfield, Iowa, and he set up something in India. I, I, so I, I followed all that, and I, I've been a TM practitioner myself uh, since Wonderful. I was uh, in my mid twenties, early mid twenties, and uh, uh, I, I've supplemented and added other meditation techniques. But I've always continued with my TM as my basic foundation. So I have a lot of great regard for Maharishi and his movements. Uh, and I was invited by um, the, the head of the Maharishi University, uh, the physicist. John Hagelin, yes. John Hagelin. Hey, John Hagelin uh, to give some addresses there. And I, I gave a bunch of talks there. Actually, I raised some issues about AI and consciousness uh, more than a decade ago while speaking there. And they thought it was a bit sensational. I was raising provocative issues. I would like to raise <laughs> them again today with you. Uh, Wonderful. I have seen your book and it's an exciting book. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great joy to be with you. It's wonderful to be on your uh, great uh, podcast and presentations. I'm also honored with all your work. 
in different fields and it's a joy to participate. So for the sake of those who might not know, Dr. Nader is both a life sciences expert in the medical field uh, and a spiritualist, scientist, uh, humanitarian. Uh, uh, and, and so he brings uh, many, many things together, many aspects together. Uh, so, so, so Dr. Nader, should we, uh, uh, I, I think this is a rare opportunity for me to have you. Uh, and, and so many people in your organization have said, you should go and meet Dr. Nader. I mean, uh, uh, <laughs> so many people I've met and interviewed and have got to know me, uh, have said, you know what you are discussing, uh, you should go and meet him. He's the person you should meet. So once uh, this COVID settles down a little bit more, I, I'd love to come and uh, spend time and in person have these conversations. It will be my great joy anytime. It's settling down, so let's make it uh, sooner than later. <laughs> Absolutely, I'd love to do it. So, Dr. Nader, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, have it as a kind of a free flow conversation. Uh, I have a few uh, uh, questions or topics to kind of seed the conversation and then let it just go free flow. You can ask me questions also, and I will give you my positions also, my views, and we'll have a good exchange of uh, views on, on the subject. So to, to set Wonderful. the ball rolling, uh, give, give us your perspective on what is reality and what is consciousness and what's their relationship? Uh, this is a question, of course, that has been discussed through the ages. And ultimately, we come to two poss possible general uh, categories. As the reality starts with something physical, some kind of energy that leads to to the physical, and then the physical, which is energy and, um, you know, fields of energy coming and appearing and having fluctuations and then appearing as particles that come together to form atoms and molecules. And then by extension cells and organs and organs and <clears throat> that lead to nervous systems and uh, physiology that is more complex and orderly and something that then consciousness appears at that level or, you know, even in lower animal levels, we can have some kind of consciousness. And this would be one aspect of reality emerging from physical uh, phenomena and physical reality. And that consciousness in this case, awareness is an emergent quality. Now, there is also the dual aspect of reality. That would be what we would call a monistic aspect, which means there is one source, there is one ultimate source, and that source can be physical and everything else emerges. It could be also dualistic, which means there are two different sources. So there is the uh, pure being, pure consciousness, there is a divine reality or some sort of unmanifest non-physical entity or reality or force, if you like even, but it's not physical. And then at the same time, there is something physical. Now, the problem with this dualistic reality is how they talk to each other and how they interact with each other and where does one come from the other. And there is also the uh, ancient, if you like, uh, Vedic uh, ultimate reality, which also has been interpreted in different ways, which says that consciousness is the basis of everything, that actually there is consciousness, some kind of awareness, uh, ultimate awareness, and that it is the consciousness interacting with its own dynamics that appears as matter. So there you get the ideas that have been promoted as physical and material are appearances, they are a maya, they are illusions in a sense. And so there are these broad categories and then you have within them a number of uh, diverse values. You have panpsychism, you have uh, monistic dualism, dual uh, or, you know, uh, they're monistic, which means only one area, but two aspects appearing, and many, many variations in that. 
My feeling and my proposal is that consciousness is actually all there is. So consciousness is real. Uh, we know it. Uh, it is not an emergent quality. It is the primary value of uh, reality. So if you want to go back beyond the Big Bang and start what was there before, you can say that is an entity which is beyond time and space that we call consciousness. And it is the dynamics of this consciousness that lead to the manifestation of the universe and the world as it is. The difference is that this is not just an illusion, the appearances, the reality that appears. It's actually also real, but real on its level. So it comes to the definition of what is reality on the unmanifest level, it's consciousness. What is reality on the manifest level? It is also real, but it depends on the observer. So reality is no more object sitting out there, but it's an interaction between a subject and an object that leads to what I call a bit of consciousness, a moment of experience. And that moment of experience is relative to the subject, the object, and the process of connecting the subject to the object. And it is real, it is real. So reality has all these layers, although ultimately at the infinite, at the primordial value, it is all consciousness. So this is in few words, but it has to be, of course, kind of explained and unpacked to see how it makes sense and how we can uh, really figure out uh, if it fits with, with normal observations and common uh, values of law and natural law and other factors. So this is wonderful. Uh, you know, one of the most influential books I read was by Maharishi, uh, The Science of Being and the Art of Living. Uh, and of course, the second part of the title, The Art of Living, became the name of uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar's movement. And he was a follower of uh, uh, Maharishi uh, for many years when he was a young man. Uh, he used to follow him around and learned everything from him. So you can see a lot of the so a lot of the techniques he teaches are uh, TM derived. So that book was explaining the sort of the kind of things that you're talking about. It was I'm, I'm very glad that now it has taken root uh, as a global discourse, uh, which Maharishi brought to, to the world. Uh, so I'm I, I subscribe to that. I, I subscribe to that, and I think uh, most of my viewers subscribe to the Vedic worldview. So we are both on the same page. Now. Beautiful. Not not discussing the other views for a moment, but just discussing the Vedic view, which you articulated very nicely. I have two or three questions on that. So the first first question I have is, uh, as a medical person, you know that while consciousness ha has an effect on matter, uh, and and that's what people talk about, manifest matter consciousness. But the reverse is also true because you can give anesthesia and the person is unconscious. You can give him a painkiller and he's, he's no longer in pain. So how can a shadow cause an effect on the object? If you have an object and it's shadow, uh, how can the shadow uh, produce a, 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 a cause an effect on the object when it's just a shadow? Uh, or, or, or how can the mirror image produce an effect on the object so in, in that, giving that analogy, how can matter produce an effect on consciousness? Because it does. It's, yes, um, this question is valid in case we decide that matter and consciousness are two different things. So that takes us to a dualist point of view in which there is matter on one side and there is consciousness on the other side. And so, in this case, you know, if we decide that they are dual values, then this is the big question in philosophy and in science. What is the uh, efficacy of the causal efficacy, they call it, the effect, uh, one causing the other, how can they interact? If we want to stay within the true Vedic, uh, ultimate Vedic Advaita Vedanta uh, concept of reality, Actually, everything is consciousness, which means what we see as matter 
is also consciousness expressing itself and being observed from a certain perspective as being solid material. Now, we know right. that our body is made mostly out of emptiness. You know, if you take away all the space between molecules and within molecules, between atoms and between the nucleus and the surrounding of the atom and all of that, we, we end up with emptiness in general. Now, right. That, right. that doesn't explain anything because it's just an idea. It's just an idea to say that what we perceive, what we see, is that, is just our perception. So, for example, if you had infrared wavelengths of light, you don't see it. So for the eyes, the infrared or the ultraviolet on a physical level do not exist. We need an instrument, of course, that will allow us to see infrared and uh, allow us to see ultraviolet and all the other x-rays and all of that. So what our perception actually sees is only a part of reality. And it's on the basis of the senses that we have said and been defining reality as we define it today and say, well, there is matter, it's physical, it's all made out of gross molecules, it's the classical physics. But then we discovered that this classical physical reality, as you go deeper into the essence of what matter is, it vanishes and you get into fields of energy. So we went from localization in time and space with uh, things being here and not there and things being uh, uh, having specific speed and specific momentum and being localized to actually as the scientists themselves through the scientific method went deeper into what is mat matter is what is matter made of they discovered that matter is made out of you know, gradually molecules, then atoms, and the atoms are made out of elementary particles. And what are the elementary particles? They kept diving deep to find what is the essential reality, which was the first question. Where does everything come from? And you find that the particles themselves are fields of energy. So there is the electromagnetic field, the weak field, weak force field, and the strong force field, and then the gravitational field, the force field, four fields. And so matter and energy were equivalent and also the fields have been more and more unified so that ultimately we can see and there are theories of what we call a unified field of all the laws of nature, a unified field of reality, which means if you go into a tree and say, what is the tree made of ultimately? Of course, it's made out of molecules and all of that. But ultimately, you can say it's the unified field. What is the moon made of? It's the unified field. What is my body made of? It's the unified field. Now, my attention, my consciousness, my awareness, my physical instrument, which is the nervous system, can only perceive that much of reality. So if I project a 700 nanometer uh, wavelength light, I see it red. But if somebody is colorblind, they'll see it gray or shades of gray. Uh, if there is somebody who is not able to see light, then it doesn't exist. A machine will detect certain wavelengths. A uh, hadron collider, a large hadron collider like at CERN in Switzerland, will see particles and uh, particles flying around and energy fields. So what I'm saying is all of these are different levels of perception, which depend on our nervous system that is made out of actually ultimately that field. Now, the ancient knowledge and this the proposal that we have uh, in front of us is that all this is a dynamics of consciousness it's actually the consciousness but looking at itself from different perspectives 
that generate this one perspective of matter from a certain point of view, which is our human point of view. So whenever you are acting, we say on the physical, you are actually acting on a certain aspect of consciousness. And therefore it is not an interaction between two different substances or qualities or categories of being. It's all consciousness, but you're acting on consciousness from one perspective on the gross level, as you can act on consciousness from the perspective of the more subtle level, from the level of consciousness itself. So, so in other words, we can think of consciousness not as some uniform thing, which is you know the problem in English because you don't have too many, all the different words in Sanskrit, there are 14, 15, 16 different words that all get translated as consciousness. Uh, so, so what, what we can say is, Consciousness with a capital C, consciousness yeah. as A, hyphenated, consciousness hyphenated as hyphenated A, and consciousness as B, and consciousness as C could be different levels. So consciousness as right. one level, consciousness as another level, consciousness as another level. And there's so many different levels. All of them are ultimately consciousness as something. So ultimately, the, right. the, material, uh, the, the entity is consciousness, but consciousness taken many forms, taken many forms, and it is the interaction of these forms of consciousness that we call the world. So exactly. could we say that, that the, what, we th I, what I'm experiencing as my consciousness is the level of consciousness that is consciousness as Rajiv. And you're, right. you're, you're experiencing consciousness as Dr. Nader, that is what you're calling that you're conscious. But our my this consciousness as Rajiv is the one which with the anesthesia can be knocked out. Right. Okay. So even though consciousness as Rajiv can be knocked out and it looks like it must become, must be like an object because it's an object of causation. Uh, so, but what it means is that, that that is not affecting consciousness per se. It is affecting consciousness as Rajiv. Would you accept that? Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, beautiful explanation. So there is so, the one absolute consciousness, which is what we call the unified field. And that is the substance, if you like, the, in a sense, it's not a physical substance, but we can say that's that from which everything is made. It's like you say, I have a golden ring, I have a golden necklace, I have a golden bracelet, I have a golden statue. They are all gold, but they look different. They are made out of gold. So you can look at the gold and say, this is gold, this is gold, this is gold, this is gold. That's right. But you can also like, this is a statue, this is a bracelet, this is a ring, this is a necklace. And so you are using that transformation of the dynamics of consciousness to appear as being different objects yet the essence is the same. Yes, yes, that's beautiful. And I, I, I fully agree with that. Now, can we say, so one of the, one of the views in uh, certain interpretations of Vedanta, uh, uh, Advaita Vedanta, say that the highest consciousness, pure consciousness, has no content. Another view says, which I find more interesting, that rather than saying it has no, no, no content, it's empty, it is actually pregnant with all contexts. It's, it's pregnant with all possibilities. So the possibilities that emerge are not coming out of nowhere. Are they not coming out of uh, some magic place? There is no other outside world, outside entity that brings these possibilities. The possibilities are, all possibilities are built into consciousness as its very nature. So that way, that way you also uh, address the issue of how does manifestation happen and all these kind of contexts emerge. Where did all these contexts come from? Where did the law of gravitation come from? Where did this idea of time and space come from? All of that. Uh, but if you, if you take the, the, the qualified non-dualism, uh, uh, you know, then, then all of these contexts pre-existed as part and parcel of the very nature of pure consciousness. So what do you think of this difference between 
the people who say pure consciousness is totally empty and then of course they have to they have to say that the all the contexts are maya they are illusion and then they get in trouble because then if they are illusion then how come they have a causal effect you know uh, right. then they say okay the causal effect is also an illusion so then they say there is no free will or anything like that we'll come to that also in a moment so they are going down yes. that path uh, where where each answer leads to more questions and the other possibility is to say that consciousness pure consciousness the only thing that exists the ultimate existence is already pregnant with all possibilities as it's all contexts and in fact uh, that is the idea of a ganesh the origin the source of uh, the root uh, is is context so first thing is the context and then the content comes within those contexts what do you think of this this kind of a view of uh, consciousness even when we call it pure it already has all the context all the infinity infinity is built into it what do you think of that yeah absolutely absolutely and that's the uh, proposal actually we have uh, based on that knowledge ancient knowledge of the veda and our maharishi mahesh yogi explained it and elaborated on it and that is actually uh, the two values are not contradictory uh, it's not that there is either one or the other necessarily but there is the value and that's called in the veda purusha value which is the purushottama quality that value of infinite silence is also one of those aspects so that aspect is there but then since it is consciousness then it is conscious so to be conscious why we call it consciousness because it is conscious and to be conscious means there is an observer that is observing something uh, so observer uh, looking object and subject so there is a subject and an object observer and observed and there must be something connecting the observer to the observed otherwise it's not a process of consciousness and so this is already the seed of the multiplicity coming out of unity so there is one unified being of consciousness we can say purusha quality and its nature what is its nature its nature is to be conscious that is the quality inherent within it it's not a contradiction so there is that infinite consciousness but it also is conscious and it conscious of itself and it conscious in all possible ways to be conscious so it is full of all the dynamics of how a consciousness is conscious and this is actually as marishi explains these are the laws of nature that emerge from the dynamics of how consciousness is conscious and this is the veda this is what marshi calls the veda so the veda which means knowledge in sanskrit i'm saying this for the sake of the viewers or the listeners of course you know very well and much more than that so veda is knowledge is knowledge of the dynamics of consciousness and actually one of my research was to look at those dynamics of consciousness which are the syllables and sounds and uh, and uh, shlokas and sutras and uh, mantras and uh, uh, suktas of the veda and see how they are organized and how yes. they are emerging and their sequence and see that they are actually the blueprint of the physical value of the, what we call matter and what we call physiology in, in, in that sense and so all possibilities are present as a template as a background in consciousness uh, and so this is a beautifully explained as you said it so so we could say that consciousness includes within itself the entire veda as the structure of consciousness can we say that beautiful exactly that, absolutely that, that consciousness has built in structure which is the veda so veda is a template it's like the meta narrative it's at a meta level and then then from that it keeps manifesting at more and more gross levels and gross levels and so on the whole all of existence so this right. leads me to a, to a question that 
people haven't asked i think it's a it's a and, and i love i've been asking it for a long time so we have it, we have the concept of existence and then people discuss what is the nature of existence and is it material is it consciousness you know but suppose we ask a more fundamental question why is there something as opposed to nothing so uh, people say people say all this exists therefore god must have created it that's the very standard abrahamic answer but then you say well why does god exist in other words in other words why is there anything why is there consciousness what if there were nothing i mean suppose there was nothing you know absolute non existent so sure uh, yeah first, nothingness <laughs> nothingness so the question it, it, it seemed like uh, you know if there were nothing that we wouldn't be here asking the question even but wh- why is there something so really why is there something as opposed to nothing this question is asked from the perspective of physicalism in a sense which means yes. we are used to discuss things in the perspective of space and time and in the perspective of material reality so it is bewildering uh, how actually uh, something material comes from where would it come what is the origin of it if you know there is a god where the god gets the energy where the god gets the physical material to actually well, create there a god why, or why is there a god even that's my question yes well the que- so, you know, the question in the, is in the 10th mandala in the 10th mandala this myth the creation when it asks yes. uh, where did this come from uh, who brought all this and all that you know what is the cause what is the cause of the cause purusha sukta of- also yeah yeah and and then and then uh, and then uh, uh, the the the, the he, it says ask him who he, maybe he knows or maybe he doesn't okay and so we are very <laughs> happy that okay the uh, ultimate nor maybe he also doesn't know but then my question even says why is there even that guy why is there even why is there even a brahman as opposed to not yeah. nothingness i mean i think it's a it's a question yes. to an answer but it's just a fun thing to ask <laughs> it has an answer if we accept that our logic that we use is usually within the context of the physical reality of time and space if we transcend time and space which mean we go beyond what is the beginning what is the end and the specific expanse of time and space and we have a value that is non physical and non material and beyond time and space we can postulate that that is pure existence so that is what there is and there you do not say where it comes from so if it is something that is itself nothing physical and nothing material then we cannot ask the question from the perspective of the physical and the material so But our you know, of habit the... of yeah go ahead please please Let's no see. go ahead that's fine <laughs> so one of the big debates between the vedic people and the buddhists was that vedic said that there is a positive existence ultimate it's a positive it's a positive existence which we are calling consciousness and the buddhists of the view that there is no such thing because the moment you have anything that is ultimate you know then you're going to essentialize it and then you're back into the same essentialization and reductionism and all that and to that the vedic people would say no 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 that ultimate thing is beyond conceptualization it 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 is not an object of conception and so they would kind of go back and forth and dance and neither one able to reconcile it so i think the the <laughs> could we say that we as human beings are the 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 extent of our logic the extent of the machinery we have for the faculty we have for thinking is incapable of making sense of that kind of question because it may be something that we it is capable i would yeah. i would argue it is capable if we accept to remove our prejudices okay when we think from the context of the physical the material we think of beginning and end of time and space of something palpable and something that the senses can acknowledge and recognize 
And we have been so overwhelmed by our senses, which is limited perception, that we perceive everything from those perspectives. What we have to accept is that if we go beyond the perception of physical and time and space and beginning and end, then we have no problem to say that there is, we call it something, but then even when you say something, it's kind of saying that it's something physical. That's why we can say there is a nothing, but that nothing has the quality of consciousness. I'm not saying there is, you know, the God or this and that. This, we're not getting into this discussion, how God emerges or God, what is God or not. What we're saying, it's nothingness, but nothingness is consciousness. So consciousness is nothingness and it's fullness at the same time. So everything is consciousness. Everything remains consciousness forever is consciousness and consciousness is beyond material space and time limitations so we cannot ask the questions where nothing comes from you cannot say where nothing comes from it's nothing how do you say it's where it's coming from so if we say it is nothingness but consciousness of course one can say oh but you're saying it's consciousness so it is something well when you say that you're saying it from the perspective of a physical sensual usual perception it's not from the sense of uh, transcending which means going beyond the time and space limitations in which we have been plunged and we feel that everything has to happen within time and space and therefore everything has a beginning everything has an end where did it come from which means when did it be when did it start that's what we're asking so that is really the answer and therefore both have something right it's like it is nothing but from the perspective of our usual perception of what things are it is nothing but it has a quality of consciousness so this is wonderful so i want to i want to sort of uh, articulate in a different way some of the things we've talked about and i want to introduce a word I want to introduce a word which is very powerful both in the Vedic context and in the Western science context. And the word is causation, causation. So the world of manifestation is causation. Everything is a cause that produces some effect. You cannot do something and have no effect. And nor can you in the other direction say something happened without a cause. Everything has a cause. So every cause produces an effect and every effect has some cause. And so you are in this web, web, uh, it, you know, and the Buddhists say that this web of causation is what we are experiencing as the reality. And the idea of uh, Nirvana is to, uh, is to get out of this web of causation. Uh, the, the, the web of causation in the Indian Sanskrit is karma uh, because karma is causation and, and right. it's different from the physics causation because physics physics is a subset of karma in the sense that karma says all the physics in, is causation, but there's also a delayed causation in, phys, in karma. I mean, you can create right. a sanskar, a vasana, which is, a, which is affecting the, the, the probability for future effects. It is not that cause produces effect, but cause produces a, uh, cause produces a vasana, and then at some point in time, the vasana, which is catalyzed properly, produces an effect. So right. that is what differentiates karma from physics causation. Uh, and if you were right. to take, if the day physics accepts that uh, some, some causes produce a delayed effect, that there is some kind of a right. cloud, some kind of a cloud memory in the cosmos, uh, uh, which is the karmic memory. And where, where the, uh, the effect of a physical event is saved, and then at the future time, it affects the outcomes. So the day that kind of a, uh, explosion of physics happens, it will be a karma theory, basically. That, that's how I see the, the difference between the two. So what do you think of this idea of causation as a kind of a framework in which to compare the karma and physics? Absolutely. Um, 
The thing is, the manifest creation happens within uh, space-time. So there is a space-time element. And space-time element means that the reaction can take a little time to produce, uh, to, to, to come after the action. So uh, action and reaction can be automatically computed, but the result of the action might be delayed by space and time because we need separation and separation is part of what manifestation is about so in manifestation it is the appearance of separation between the subjects and the objects and different objects as if the objects exist on their own but in reality everything is entangled everything is interconnected so when you plant a mango seed you're going to get mangoes in five years ten years whatever you're you know the time that it takes for it to mature and all of that so there is a, a reaction that happens uh, in time and space in due time and space now on the computation level if you like on the ultimate computation level every action is immediately computed in the, if you like, the unmanifest field of what karma is about. So everything is automatically computed, but the results of the action can happen in delayed time, and that is what is karma. So I absolutely uh, agree with you. So we could say that, uh, you know, just like right now, they're inventing these goggles to imagine different things and live in a virtual world. We'll talk about it in, in the in a subsequent episode right now. Uh, similarly, I think consciousness uh, has this, is looking through uh, a lens of space-time position to experience what we are experiencing as the world. The world as we experience is limited and contained by the fact that we have a lens grafted, uh, which is a lens of causation and it looks at everything and looks for, okay, this happened because of that, this happened because of that. And as you said very wonderfully, uh, causation is the result of separation between spa in spatial terms and time-wise. And so uh, since we cannot comprehend, uh, we humans cannot comprehend simultaneously all space and all time from minus infinity to plus infinity, all of it together, therefore the slicing of reality into uh, you know moments. Moments is a kind of an ap 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 appearance. So the slicing of reality into moments for the purpose of our ability to comprehend gives us this illusion of time. Uh, and, and, and so that illusion of time, we rationalize the pattern and then say, oh, there's causation. Uh, this causes that because, because we cannot see the simultaneity of all that. So that, 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 is, that, is that similar to what you're saying? Beautiful, exactly like that, exactly like that. So we have different states and levels of consciousness also when we go through. I mean, it reminds me that I didn't answer fully the question about anesthesia. You know, anesthesia can block certain dynamics of consciousness and other dynamics will continue. You see, we think of consciousness only as equal to what human consciousness is. What we have to realize is consciousness is a broad range from very limited consciousness to very high consciousness. And so you have, you can say that the atom is an expression of consciousness, but it's a very, very limited, meager level of consciousness that practically almost has nothing to do with human consciousness. Yet when the atom reacts to gravity, for example, or with stone, falls attracted by the gravitational field of the earth we are saying the stone is sensing the gravitational field it is not sensing like we sense it's not saying oh i'm going to fall i'm going to break myself it has no sense of self it has no sense of being no sense of anything yet it responds to gravity that response we are also calling we can call is very meager limited level of consciousness. So we are broadening the understanding of consciousness from infinite consciousness 
to limited consciousnesses going through plants, through animals, to higher consciousness in humans. But even humans, they go through different consciousness states. They go through sleep state where you say, I'm unconscious, but in fact, your body is conscious because if it's cold, you're going to wake up or you're going to even cover yourself subconsciously. That means your cells of the body are responding to cold. So even under anesthesia, you shut down some aspect of the brain, but the whole other parts of the body responds. You know, people who are under anesthesia, you know, they, they have high blood pressure when, you know, there is a trauma or some damage or something happens. They respond to cold, they respond to heat. So the body is conscious in a sense, but at a much lower level. Now, when you go to dream, you are also conscious, but in a fictional level. When you are awake, you are conscious on a higher level. And you can be conscious even on a much higher level of transcendental consciousness, of cosmic, what we call cosmic consciousness. We are Humans can be conscious of pure consciousness, that, that state of silence that we talked about at the beginning. So there are all these layers and levels of consciousness that are throughout uh, you know, the, the reality of life. And the interactions, you know, like if you ask me what causes human consciousness, it's not just the brain, it's every cell of the body, is every atom in the body is contributing to the general reality of who we are and give us that quality of consciousness, that ability to be conscious in that particular way. Of course, the nervous system contributes much, much more than, for example, the finger or the, uh, you know, or the arm, but the the whole it's the whole that creates the the quality of consciousness that we have so with this kind of a very i think we created a foundation for topics so one of the things i want to discuss with you is to find out is ask you what do you how do you explain the debate between free will and determinism because in the world of causation, there is determinism. I mean, there, there is determinism in the sense that is what causation is a model, is a predictive model of effects produced by causes. Uh, whether the effect is produced in a 100% certain way or as a probability, even the probability is deterministic because you predicted the probability. Uh, uh, right. So, but, but then there is the idea of free will, which says that uh, consciousness with a big C cannot be contained within this determinism. Because if it were, then then we have we have don't have the concept of of transcendence, because the whole idea of, to me transcendence, as the TM uh, process helps us achieve an experience for ourselves, is a, an existence beyond causation. Because in that moment you are not feeling any causation, you are not causing anything, and nothing is causing uh, what's going on. It's a it's a it's an amazing feeling. It's a freedom from. So, would you say transcendence means freedom from causation, and and uh, and and the, in that context, how would you explain the debate between free will and determinism? Transcendence is freedom from causation because the ultimate reality is uh, uncaused and is existing by itself, untouched by change and transformation and remains always equal to itself. So that ultimate reality maintains its equanimity, its balance. For every plus, you have a minus for everything, so that it maintains its silence even within its dynamism. As we said at the beginning, there is silence, and there is all the possibilities that are already available in an unmanifest way, non-manifest way, which later they manifest and there is a logic for how they manifest and why they manifest. But in terms of determinism and freedom, there is absolute law, absolute order, which usually one would say means determinism, because if you start from a certain point, every action leads to re a reaction, everything is well computed, there is karma, and therefore there is no place for freedom. And many you know, thinkers and scientists imagine that there is no place for freedom. However, the manifestation, again, we come back to the point, happens within space and time. This is a very important factor. And within space and time, 
we have freedom we have freedom to act and we have the response to our action that will come undoubtedly but it is delayed as we said this is how this reaches again the uh, the issue of the delay of karma within the framework of space and time so although there is orderliness on the infinite level there is like a computer <laughs> that maintains all balance at the same time you are free to act what is the difference if the action leads to an immediate exact reaction then nothing happens if you produce a positive charge and at the same time you have to maintain balance create a negative charge and if they are at the same place in the same time you get no charge because plus and minus they negate each other so if you produce a positive charge but separate it in space then you can get a negative charge so the balance is maintained but they exist separately either in time or space and therefore you have the ability to produce an effect and experience it as the result of your freedom within space and time parameters but you always have to wait for your reaction that within space and time will come back to you so that means the the actual computing of balance this is the principle of karma also is always there but within the time and space limitations you can be free and act freely completely freely depends on the individual and depends on the constraints of course freedom is also something that grows uh, with greater consciousness that's a different topic but you can act freely but you cannot avoid the results of your actions so what you choose today you plant a mango seed that is your freedom but when you want to go to the tree you cannot say i want to eat orange uh, uh, fruit or apples from that tree from that tree you have planted the mango seed you have to get the mangoes if you want to eat something now if you're clever you buy the mangoes sell them to somebody who has the oranges and, <laughs> and, and you can still eat the oranges but for this you have a broader consciousness that's a different topic so, yeah. so determinism yeah. so, on the global level freedom within time and space and freedom is depending on the level of consciousness so can i say that to sum this up can i say that uh, at this moment in time i'm sitting here uh, i do, i have freedom within certain constraints right uh, for example i'm sitting in princeton i'm not sitting in uh, some other town so i don't have the choice to be in that town because there is no way i can be there uh, i am uh, 71 years old i have no choice of being 30 Uh, I have uh, I have a certain set of circumstances. I have to do this, that, and whatever is happening. I have health circumstance, whatever. So all the realities that I'm facing are constraints that are that I don't have freedom. I cannot choose the nature of the present moment being offered to me. I can I have the freedom on how I respond to it. So so can we say that? the deck of cards being dealt every single moment has been predetermined because of past events so i'm dealt with a certain deck of cards that define who i am where i am what i'm doing this and that those are things i can't change my entire portfolio uh, but within that set of constraints of whatever defines me in this moment i have the freedom now to respond to it within within the constraints available to can we say that that's right. a, so the the determinism is about the in terms of time it's it's about how the present moment was constructed and the freedom is how i act in the present moment beautifully and how my present moment action will constrain me in the future yes so now i am free but my freedom is determinism of tomorrow 
So my condition yes. today yeah. is also the result of my karma, which is a beautiful, you know, and full, you know, paradigm in the Vedic tradition. That is, you know, we we carry our karmas, which means we have decided something, we have done something, and that comes to us as a determined uh, circumstances and limitations and constraints. But we still have the options to change it. That's why when I took the example of the mango tree and the oranges, it really depends on our consciousness. Somebody whose consciousness is very limited, they go to the mango tree, they have planted a mango seed, they go to the mango tree and they'd like to eat apples, but they see it's mango. If their consciousness is limited, they say, oh my God, I can't do anything about it. It is the mango, I eat the mango. Somebody who has broader consciousness, they can put the mango on the internet or they can go to the market with their mango and exchange it for apples. So although you have been constrained to get mangoes from your action of planting a mango seed, when your consciousness broadens, you can find solutions to solve your problem and exchange the mangoes for apples or for whatever you want. So we have the freedom to act today we have to meet the consequences of our action in the future. But if we grow in consciousness, we can overcome uh, that. And if we are infinite in our consciousness, we can actually imagine the possibility to be 30 years old, to be now in Switzerland or to be in Princeton or to be in Boston. But that is, of course, beyond what we understand today as being possibilities. But ultimate consciousness allows us actually to transcend even those limitations and able to clear them up. So there is great hope in all possibilities if we broaden consciousness. That's why the technology we teach. Yes, so go ahead, please. The technology we teach is that of transcendence because yes. it's not transcendental meditation, which is our specialty. It's not just to remove stress and which is great is the best technique to get rid of stress and feel better but it's a technique to transcend which means to go to the unified source to go to consciousness where as we said before we are beyond the limitations of causality and beyond the limitations of limit limited constraints and we are acting from the field of all possibilities and that is what we see that you can now achieve more even through thought we can uh, you know create even world peace through uh, raising consciousness and improving social uh, conditions and this we have done research on it it's something we have researched very carefully and we see that consciousness has an impact on behavior of society and between nations etc so there is there is freedom within causation to to uh, to act freely given the the determined state of the present moment uh, the option right. available and then there is freedom from causation from determinism yes. from at a higher level of consciousness i think this right. is a wonderful wonderful uh, conclusion for part 1 what i would like to do <laughs> is uh, bring this to closure and and thank you very much and then we can we can uh, go on to uh, part 2 thank you so wonderful. much wonderful i look forward i look forward thanks to you thank you i look forward to being with you again it was really delightful thank you thank you thank you